the story I'm going to uh, add to this one today is the evolution of central banks. Central banks, again, are an invention slowly appear, that slowly appeared and changed, and they've had uh, very different roles in history. And uh, the idea of central banks, as with money, is it's, it's, a move, it's a move in history, but is it progress? Is it progress to have paper money and money that is immaterial? And is it progress to have central banks? And uh, some parts of the story are sad, and there hasn't been progress, I don't think. So today it'll be the story of how central banks slowly dis appeared, increased, were nationalized by governments, used by governments, and then now there are some uh, um, experiments trying to get rid of central banks by having money on the internet, as we will discuss at the end of here. So this is the story I want to tell today. And uh, of course, I will listen to what you have to say on, in the discussion as yesterday, uh, which is the most important part since I certainly learned from it. The frontispiece has a, um, has a, a quotation from Hayek. We can never hope to preserve the economic order unless we take from government the monopoly of issuing money. Now, this is very contentious and uh, contentious in this place because I'm sure, and yesterday we had, but today we don't have Tim Congdon, I'm sure that Tim Congdon doesn't agree with us at all. Uh, and as, as he is the kind of person he is, he doesn't agree forcefully you know, <laughs> with this sort of idea. This is simply a, qu a quotation from, from Hayek. What do I indicate to tell you something about the story? Now, there's one thing to be studied, which is the pro technical progress of central banking to have better central banks. And that, I suppose, is good for all of us. But I remember the film on the River Kwai, uh, where you had the colonel building a beautiful bridge for the Japanese to come and cross over to Burma. And he was so proud of this bridge. And when the, uh, uh, the British underground destroyed the bridge, he suddenly, he suddenly understood what he'd done. And there may be some kind of tunnel vision in this question of central banking. Beautifully working, functioning central banks that may close our eyes to reduction in individual and political freedom by having the state having this instrument. And this is what Hayek says. Uh, if we want to present, preserve freedom, perhaps we should have worse central banks or not have them at all. But I'm, uh, I'm repeating this because Tim Congdon isn't here. <clears throat> now, it's an observation that central banks have a close connection with the government. Despite talks about the independence of central banking and how the, how the monetary theory should not be governed by ministers or governed by the government, uh, still you have a close, close connection. And that close connection is, is, is much closer when you have a, cr when you have a crisis as we had in 2007, 2008. Then I remember seeing on TV uh, the, um, the president of the New York Fed, the president of the Fed, and the president of the United States together, saying what we're going to do together to get us out of the hole in which we were. And so I thought to myself, where's independence? Thank goodness, perhaps we don't want to have such independence of central banks. So, as with money, I ask myself, is money a state creation? And I think not. And is, is bank, are central banks a creation of the state? I think they are in a great part the result of commercial life. <clears throat> so still, many central banks were born uh, with, um, as a means of public finance. In fact, the, uh, the Bank of England was born in 1694 uh, because it, uh, um, it, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Bank of England was a private company. Uh, they were given a charter. Their capital was 1.94, uh, 1.2 million of pounds, which is a lot. And immediately they lent it to the government. And those 1.2 went into the government. They, uh, they needed money because they, uh, there had been the war of Spanish succession, succession and 
a lot of money thrown out of the window and therefore they needed these funds. And then f a few years later, in 1709, they doubled the, uh, the capital of the government and again it was lent, <laughs> of the bank, it was lent to the government at, at, a, uh, at a, an interest rate of 3%. Uh, which is some money, I'm sure, a 3% that, that this, the government, the British government or state, had to pay this company for receiving this money that was lent. Ah, but did they do this out of patriotism, out of the goodness of their heart, this company? No, they were given monopolies. And uh, they had the monopoly of the issue of banknotes within, later it was defined, within 50 miles of the city uh, of London. And then they had uh, also the monopoly of governing or managing the national debt and many other things that were added later. So uh, this is a typical way of cre creating a central government. You create a central government, you give them privileges, the privileges attract private money and the private money is lent to the government. Beautiful arrangement which I'm sure was needed by this new government. Uh, the, there'd been uh, the revolution or the change of system in 1688 uh, and uh, Britain was moving away from, from Britain. England was moving away from the Stuarts to a different system which uh, was more based on the Magna Carta than the previous one and so on. So on the whole perhaps it was good that you created the bank and, and financed the new, kind, the new, the new government. <clears throat> uh, now we have an example of a, of a bank that is not, that did not, that was not born from uh, government privilege that was instituted by a municipality, the Bank of Amsterdam. And I will say something uh, uh, of, the bank, of the Bank of Amsterdam. I, I have made an, an especial study of the attempts to have a central bank in Spain. The Spanish monarchy had gone through uh, a very difficult war, very harsh war with invasions on, in the Spanish mainland. Uh, the Catalans first telling the French they wanted to be French, and then when they realized what that meant of centralization, they immediately changed their tune, and so on. So we had that, and what, what we had in Spain was uh, uh, there, there were municipal pawn houses, and those municipal pawn houses received uh, or had deposits of, um, of successions, that is of, of wills that were not, hadn't been divided, and the money stayed there for a little bit, and so, lo and behold, the, uh, uh, the Spanish government said, oh, what's this money doing nothing there? And they tried to create a central bank, and it didn't work. <clears throat> so, uh, one interesting thing from the point of view of the story that central banks may be spontaneous, just as money may be spontaneous, even if it's nationalized by the government, is the wonderful idea of Charles Goodhart in the evolution of central bank, a very, very good book that has been published only twice, and that I think it's one of the best books on central banking that you have. And uh, what, what he, what in the evolution of central banks he studied was uh, the idea that there's something which is rational or necessary in, in the existence of a central bank if you have commercial banks. If you have commercial banks, it, it, it is a great saving to have to centralize the reserve of money of gold in one place and have that place uh, first inspect the people of the, 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 uh, the, the banks that have lent them the money and then see if they're not cheating and then perhaps coming to their help if they have a problem. So for good heart and I think that's a very interesting and good idea uh, the f if you have many dispersed banks it is in their interest to get together, elect a head of this club, and then ask the head of this club to watch what the other banks in the club are doing badly, uh, perhaps issuing too much paper money. And so the idea that um, the, central the, 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 the creation of central banks is, is the creation of a club is, I think, an idea that m works for uh, theory that I have, being who I am, the theory that I have that, that uh, central banks may or could be uh, the creation of uh, commercial life rather than the creation of states. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, well, the spontaneous evolution may have gone too far, and that's something I said before about the River Quay and that uh, wonderful film. It's uh, that by having better and better central banks, it helps the growth of the size and power of the state, and it helps the placing of public debt. So if you are a specialist and look only at what you have in hand, then you may say, well, we've learned a lot about central banks and they work much better than they did in the 19th century, especially the early 19th century. And we should also ask the question, what's it done to our constitution? What's it done to our freedoms, personal freedoms? And we see the state growing everywhere. And one of the helps for that growth is precisely uh, well-functioning central banks. <clears throat> now, the logic of central banks. I haven't yet started this with my history uh, because having been an employee of the Bank of Spain and uh, in, the, uh, in the intelligence department, we called it, in fact, it was a research department, there was not, not much intelligence there, but that's what we, where we were. Um, there, uh, I, I saw what the idea was that the central bank should be. And that, that was in, in the 60s, um, 65 to 70, <clears throat> when General Franco was at the, at the head of the Spanish state, and when the idea was that the government and General Franco commanded not only the, 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 the state, but also the economy, and to tell the economy where to go. And so the, the idea is that slowly central banks evolved to be, and here I have the list, banker of the government, manager of the public debt, keeper of the currency, and instrument of the government's monetary policy, manager of the foreign reserve, and uh, of the exchange and uh, capital exports controls and supervisor of the banking system. Now, that is, so to speak, the monstrous evolution of central banks to have this kind of thing, which in fact couldn't work because there's contradiction here. There are things that you can't do, um, both, both things that you can do, but this was the idea. And uh, as a young man in the Bank of Spain, I was very, um, impatient, rather sad with this, because I tended to believe in markets and said, yeah, markets are all right, but not for money. Money is outside the market. You can't leave it there because it won't work. It's a, it's a public good, and the public good has to be not governed by the public, but by the public's representatives. <laughs> and so here we, here, I, that's why in the end I, I came to London to study, because I wanted to hear about this, these exceptions to the market, whether it's justified and was it justified in the case of money. Well, finally, I'll start what I had to say today, and it was uh, the Bank of Amsterdam is a very peculiar institution, uh, and the way that Adam Smith explains it at length in The Wealth of Nations, um, in Book 4, Chapter 3, makes it even more difficult to understand. It's a very convoluted explanation. Uh, he was told by somebody in Amsterdam how it worked, and I'm not sure that he understood very well how it worked, or at least he, he couldn't explain it uh, for, for my understanding. Now, uh, it was, uh, the, there was a problem with coins. Uh, uh, they tended to be, um, to be used, and therefore they lost the faces and the stamp of the government. Also, some wicked people uh, who wanted the metal in it clipped the coins and, uh, and then filed them to get, uh, to get the, the gold or the silver out and be able to, uh, to create fake, fake currency which they could use. Uh, so. so the coins were in, in bad shape. And the Bank of Amsterdam, which was a municipal bank, decided to better the coinage of Amsterdam. Now, if you're a small country and you get coins from all over the place in Europe that circulate 
in a, in a merchant town as Amsterdam was, mm, then uh, you have the danger of recoining your, uh, your coins to make very good coins and they disappear immediately. You just take them and you don't have, the, you have had a lot of expense and you haven't been able to have a good coinage. So what they did was they opened a, a bank where if you took your bad coinage in, they put it on the books as if it were good at their, f at their face value. And, and so people took the bad coins and you had a sort of coinage reform without the expense of recoining. And people used this money that was on the books of the Bank of Amsterdam to buy and sell uh, in Amsterdam, which was a, it was a big commercial town. Uh, and and they, they bought and sold with this money, which they had brought there, but they had it recognized as good money. Then they could do another thing, which was to uh, take bullion to the, uh, uh, to the bank and have it recognized as bank money. For six months. If you didn't take it out again in six months, then you lost it. And against the bullion, they gave you a receipt. So in a way, uh, what, what that bank did was to give you bank money, that is paper money, uh, in notes, in books, to give you bank, bank money on the, uh, on the guarantee of the bullion you took in. So it was a sort of loan on the bullion. And that, uh, of course, made people use bank money even more. And if they were worried, they could go and get the bullion out uh, if they were worried that the French or the Spanish or somebody was invading them. We had this custom, you, uh, uh, and we had this custom of invading both nations, invading the low, the low countries because they were so rich. So uh, this was a sort of step towards a money, a paper money system. Just as we, we saw last time that John Laws was when he created the bank, uh, a bank in France and he became the Bank Royale, the bank of the French state. Uh, and there what, what, he, what he did is issue paper that w was able to buy the shares of the wonderful companies that he was creating in, on the Mississippi, uh, which were going to be very rich because there was a lot of, of gold in the Mississippi. Well, that ain't any uh, gold. And so the whole scheme of John Laws um, just fell through. But these, what I'm telling you is steps in the expansion of the idea of paper money, which, with which we live today. Well, in the case of the Bank of Amsterdam, it was not only paper, paper money, it was notations, uh, as if they had the internet, you know. They, they had the books and, and those, uh, those notations there were as good as money. So that was a real jump forward. Now, suddenly, uh, suddenly the central banks proved to be very important for the states. And here you have well, a part of the list. Uh, many, today any state that is, uh, uh, that is um, dignified must have a central bank, must have its own currency, and so on and so But here you have the list, the list Bank of Amsterdam, which was a sort of bank in 1609. The Swedish bank, <clears throat> they had a problem with the copper coinage. And so again, uh, they wanted to reform the coinage in Sweden. They did it through that bank. The Bank of England in 1694, I've told you the story. <clears throat> Not very dignified, but there you are. That's what we got, the Bank of France in 1800. That was Napoleon. Now, N Napoleon is a fascinating personality. Uh, I dislike him intensely. My father admired him intensely. He, when he was conquering for a time, Moscow, in Moscow, he issued the decree creating uh, the French National Theatre. What an idea. There in Moscow, in the snow, he created la Comédie Française, which still exists. And, and then <clears throat> he also, in 1800, uh, as a consul, uh, created the Banque of France and had a very solid and good currency and that gave him the finance to do all the mischief he, he did in Europe. But still you have that. Then you have the Reichsbank in 1875. That was 
that was created. Uh, it unified the banks of all the little states that you had in, in Germany because the, an empire was created there. And the, <coughs> the, the Reichsbank uh, immediately went on the gold standard, uh, courtesy of the French, who had to, get, uh, to pay Germany indemnity for the war and had to pay it in, in gold, and the gold was used as a backing for the, uh, for, for the Reichsmark, and so on. Swiss National Bank, Austrian National, Danish. The Bank of Spain, because I, I always go back to the examples I know, the Bank of Spain really started with its name in 1856, but it's much earlier uh, than that. We had uh, the Bank of San Carlos started in 1782. The previous banks to the Bank of Spain, they all went broke. Uh, but uh, yeah, the Banco de San Carlos is uh, very well known for an anecdote I told yesterday, but I can't resist to tell it again, which was we took, uh, we took Harry Johnson to the Bank of Spain on a visit, and it's a magnificent building, the present building of the Bank of Spain, full of beautiful paintings and so on, and there's a room where you have all the portraits of the first directors of the Banco de San Carlos painted by Goya very good portraits that they are. He, he was paid for them. He was a, a shareholder of the Banco San Carlos, Goya was. A rich man because he was such a good painter. And so Harry Johnson, when he saw those paintings and all the magnificent building, he'd been drinking whiskey from 11 in the morning as he tended to do. He said, I can see who prints the money. And exactly the money was used for these beautiful um, uh, buildings, Bank of Japan, Bank of Italia, and the Federal Reserves in 1913. That's, that is the most important bit. Because, though I haven't studied it carefully, and it's something I want to think about, there usually is in the world a world currency. And uh, the world currency for a time was the Spanish doubloon, uh, pieces of eight uh, of great quality, uh, the Spanish state was careful to have an inflation within S Spain, but not affecting the, the currency that was used uh, all over the world. And then you had others, for a time the French franc, the, the pound, and now it's the dollar. And do, does then the world need an imperial currency? Does it help in, in growing? Uh, it seems, again, if you look at reality, you do have one. From time, uh, uh, one following the other. Now we have the, the dollar. Uh, God may preserve it because we have it, uh, it, it could be the renminbi to, to take its place. All right, now here we have another exception to the progressive story towards uh, a central bank, and that is Scottish free banking. There's been a lot of discussion about Scottish free banking because. It's one of those examples that everybody hates uh, because it goes against the grain. And in this case, it was a f banking system that did have a central bank in a way because it was the Bank of England that in the end, if the, if the S Scottish banks needed money, needed coin or <coughs> needed liquidity, they came to the Bank of England to, to get it. And so in a way, it's not a system that's free of a central bank, but it did work by competition among issuing banks. Even today, for those of us here, or foreigners, when you go to Scotland, which you should go, you will see that you can't use your Bank of England notes, you have to use the Scottish notes, and that's a tradition uh, that comes from those times. Uh, I was very sorry to see the Royal Bank of Scotland go broke. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> the system had some characteristics which are, <coughs> sorry, especially interesting for the kinds of us, source of us, and that you had competing paper issues of money. And there was a mechanism to control that they didn't over-issue. And that mechanism was a chamber of uh, uh, what, let me see, a chain, what you call it when you do, sorry, when you, uh, I must have it here, uh, 
a chamber where you you see what the different debts and and uh, and assets are of the different banks, and that was published in the newspapers. So if a bank started issuing too much, the the value of that paper compared with the paper of the other banks went down, and people were uh, aware of what was happening. And another thing, another mechanism which is very interesting, they the the banks. Um, uh, the Scottish banks ha uh, had convertibility into, into gold or into Bank of England paper, but they had a clause which allowed them to suspend convertibility at 5% for a number of months. So if you didn't have enough liquidity and somebody came to you, you said, look, here's the clause. I can't give you the Bank of England notes or the coins, but I promise to give them soon, and meanwhile, I'll pay you a 5%, uh, 5 rate of interest. And there's been a big discussion, which I've summarized on, uh, on this slide. Now, here I come to, for the second time in these, uh, <coughs> in these lectures, to one of my heroes, Henry Thornton. He was a very good banker himself, a very modest man because he foresaw many of the things that happened and didn't try and, uh, and um, blow, into, blow his trumpet to say what he'd done. Also, he was a member of the, of the Clapham Chapel, who were so active in stopping slave uh, trade um, and having the, the British Parliament use the Navy to stop the slave trades that was carried out by the wicked Spanish, Portuguese, Basques, and so on. We, we uh, took slaves from one place and took them to, to America. Well, that became illegal, and some the persons who helped get that illegal were the, 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 the chapel to which Henry Thornton belonged. Now, he wrote a wonderful book in 1802, an inquiry into the nature and effects of the paper uh, credit of Great Britain. One of the wonderful things of modernity, which I've been using these days very much, is that I can use the internet to read these books. They are all there in Google Books and others. So it's really wonderful. I don't have to go to a library to see them. I love going to libraries, but uh, it's more comfortable to do it in your room. And I've been able to reread this inquiry into the nature and effects of paper credit of Great Britain. What he was saying, paper credit, what he was saying is that paper money was here to stay. And he explained how, how it functioned. So he spoke of, <coughs> of, uh, uh, of circulating paper to include banknotes and bills of exchange. Um, and he had a wide definition of money that did not yet include sa side deposits because there weren't any side deposits that could, be, uh, that could be equated to the ones we have today. <clears throat> and uh, one of his phrases, uh, a fallacy involved, he, dis dis he, dis uh, dis uh, he criticized the fallacy involved in the supposition that paper credit is, is, uh, it might be abolished. It won't be, and it hasn't been. So he saw the future. Um, and then he had uh, a very good two rules for the Bank of England. Uh, there are reasons for never greatly diminishing Bank of England notes. And secondly, the tendency for a too great issue of bank paper produces an excess of the market price above the mint price of gold. So you saw the limits that you have to have for, <coughs> uh, for paper money. Now we come to a shocking bit of the story. Um, a shocking bit, I mean, for, for those of us who admire Ricardo, as a great defender of economic freedom and other freedoms. Yeah, he belonged to a group, uh, the Benthamites, the philosophical radicals who were in favor of uh, votes for women and were in favor of the freedom of freeing slaves and so on. So it was a good book and, uh, group. And here we have Ricardo, who, who will forever live in the memory of humanity because he proposed the history of comparative costs to explain the advantages of, inter of, of international trade. Um, people haven't really understood it. 
I remember Lionel Robbins, who was my, the, uh, the supervisor of my thesis, saying, uh, under comparative cost is the pons asinorum of economics. Pons asinorum was in Euclid, a theorem that if you didn't understand, you, you would never understand any uh, or ge geometry. And here, if you don't understand uh, comparative cost, then you don't understand economics, full stop, and that's it. There are some people in the White House who don't, but there, there you are. Uh, we must have been doing th something to be punished. Now, uh, Ricardo was very much in favor of the convertibility of currency into, into gold, because that was a guarantee that there wouldn't be too much issue of paper and there wouldn't be any inflation. So he was very much in favor of that. And during what was called the suspension, there was uh, the convertibility of Bank of England notes to gold was suspended in uh, England from 1697 to uh, 1819. Because we were, um, I nearly said we were at war with France. We were, because the Spanish and the British were allied uh, in the Peninsula War. So we, we were at war, <laughs> a war with France. And uh, suddenly there were, uh, um, the French Navy disembarked troops in Ireland. Now, that was a very nasty idea because the Irish were Catholics and therefore didn't like uh, the British government very much. <clears throat> and, and therefore, when that, that piece of news came, immediately there was a crisis in, in the city, in, in the money market, and the idea was to suspend uh, the convertibility of people were all rushing. Whenever there's a crisis, people rush for liquidity. And, uh, <clears throat> and in this case, it was rushing for, for gold. And uh, he, was, uh, he was very critical of that suspension of convertibility and hoped that soon, as it happened, uh, in 1615 he saw it, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, ba the banknotes would be convertible in into gold. So he wrote a book, Proposals for an Economical and Secure Currency, which he published in 1816. Now, of course, he said the good things. A uniformity in the value of the circulating medium is an object greatly to be desired, but at minimum cost. And the cost of having that convertibility into coins was very expensive because Britain had no coin, no gold mines. So to get the coin, to get the gold, they have to export things, have a surplus in their exports and, and get the coin back. So, that cost money, and also the coin tended to, as I said before, be clipped and, and so on. So, and you had to reissue good coin. It was very expensive. So he said, let's have convertibility, but instead of having it for anybody who had a five pound or 10, 10 pound note, not one pound, because you couldn't have one pound notes in England, <coughs> for <coughs> instead of having that, you would have rich people being able to exchange 400, 300 or 500 pounds for a gold ingot at the bank and vice versa. So gold didn't circulate, but it was there as a keeper of, of uh, the, the, level, the, the value of money. And, and so uh, he discussed the possibility of how could we tell when there was an inflation how could we tell what overall prices did? He said, too many things, too many goods are in the market. We can't do it. So it was not until Irving Fisher that we had index numbers, and he didn't know about them. <coughs> I'm sorry, yesterday I caught a cold. <coughs> so this was a step. <laughs> in the direction of having paper money, obviously. Paper money with a guarantee. So one of the things that I've insisted on, paper money is not, uh, is not backed by gold. Paper money has value because not too much is issued, given the demand. So you need a rule to stop issuers of, of, of uh, money not to issue too much. And the gold standard is a very harsh rule. 
uh, <coughs> because you, if you issue too much, then your reserve at the issuing bank goes down, and you have to, uh, and you have to uh, stop the issue. The same today with the dollar in many countries. <coughs> if, they, if they have a fixed exchange rate with the dollar, as many do, <coughs> or if they actually are dollarized and use the dollar as the national currency, <coughs> if the government does, starts doing the wrong thing, people will run away with the dollars and take them somewhere else. And that is a limit to bad behavior by the government, a bad behavior monetarily. All right, so that, that was one thing. So to, to say that uh, gold, g g gold uh, pieces wouldn't circulate, uh, <coughs> Phileas Fogg, when he went around the world, uh, took, or at least uh, the, uh, uh, the person who helped him, his aide, had a bag of gold, of gold pounds. He could go around the world with them because everybody accepted them. And also some notes of, of the Bank of England. They also were accepted around the world. Now, but now comes the shocking bit, which is that in 1824, after he died, <coughs> unfortunately of an ear infection, uh, after he died, his friends uh, published a plan for the establishment of a national bank. He wanted to nationalize the issue of money by the Bank of England. Now, I find this shocking. Maybe a good idea, maybe <laughs> very acceptable, and so on. But when I read some years ago, and yesterday again, read this, this pamphlet, well, <clears throat> it was difficult to swallow. So he proposed the nationalization of the issue of money by taking the department of issue from the bank and giving it to, not to the government, because uh, he didn't trust the government, to five commissioners who, who uh, couldn't have any business with the government or anywhere. The directors of the Bank of England had business. They were businessmen, but not these commissioners. And these commissioners would uh, use the same system. They would issue paper money if, uh, if there was too much gold uh, in their coffers and vice versa. And so what you have, but not only that, he wanted to nationalize the issue of paper money by country banks. Not only Bank of England, but the banks all around the country. So, well, <clears throat> there you are. Uh, I don't know, he tried to, to make it work better than the national health system, but I, we don't know what could happen with such a big centralized uh, institution. <clears throat> now, here we go to another bit that you need when you have a central bank. Lender of last resort. Henry Thornton, in 1802, said that you needed that <clears throat> when you had a crisis. Marvelous book, Marvelous Henry. <clears throat> and then what you had is recurrent financial crisis in England. They had their effect on Scotland, but mainly in England. The first one was after, uh, after the, um, the Battle of Waterloo, when in 16... In, in, 16, uh, in 1819, when the convertibility was re restored, there was a, 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 a recession because, as Ricardo said, the convertibility was restored at the pre-war price, though there had been an inflation in, in between. So that was a recession that you had there. Then, in 1825, uh, Spanish colonies uh, uh, conquered their freedom from Spain in a very long and bloody war. <clears throat> so in 25, all these, uh, all these republics were free and they did away with the Spanish protectionist system, which forbade most of the trade of those different countries, direct with England, direct with, with uh, the States or whatever. And so everybody, um, the, the people who, who made pots and pans, uh, and also cloth in England and so on started making lots to sell it in, in Latin America, but uh, they didn't have any money to pay for it, so there was a crisis. The 1825 crisis was uh, very harsh, and I've, I'm quoting here what one of the directors of the Bank of England said they did, which was, 
we lent by every means possible and in modes we had never adopted before. This is the Bank of England directors. We took stock on security, purchased exchequer bills. We're not only dis uh, we not only discounted outright, but we made advances on deposits of bills of exchange to an immense amount. In short, by every possible means consistent with the safety of the bank, we lent to every man, he said. And there was discovered the first idea about financial crisis, that when you have a financial crisis, it's not so much that you have to save this or that bank. The whole market has to be flooded with bills or with notes because people, when there's a crisis, want liquidity. They know they have to pay, but they don't think they are going to be paid by these uh, people who go broke. So you need liquidity uh, so that not everybody goes broke around there. <clears throat> and uh, um, then, uh, in that case, the, the Bank of England had enough gold itself to do it. But in the crisis of 1837, crisis, uh, um, <clears throat> 1819, 1825, 1830, and 31, 1837, uh, 42, uh, 56, uh, 65, and so on. You had all these crises in the first half of of the 19th century because people hadn't discovered how, what to do with the crisis. Well, <clears throat> in, in, this, in this crisis, uh, but in the 1837 crisis, the Bank of England had to ask for gold to the French, the French the Banque de France, who shipped gold over so that uh, uh, the worry wouldn't uh, <clears throat> seize the whole of the market. <clears throat> uh, and as Badger said in his, in his book on Lombard Street, nothing can most aggravate the panic than the non-lending or niggardly lending by the Bank of England. <clears throat> um, now here we come to the figure of Walter Batchelt. <clears throat> he is someone who is highly regarded, among other things, because he wrote so well and so clearly, and also he, throw, he saw through the cant. When he wrote about the monarchy, uh, the British monarchy, He's, he saw what the real role was of the British monarch, uh, representation, and uh, it, when he wrote about the Bank of England again, he, he saw how it functioned. Uh, it's been exaggerated, uh, there's been an exaggeration of what, what he discovered, but there you are, uh, he, uh, he touched the need for the Bank of England to lend and discount paper in the event of a crisis, and he's the one who quotes the director of the Bank of England of 19, 18, 1825. And then what he said, you flood the market, not save a single company. Lend freely, the, the phrase is, and it's not quite right though, about what Budget said, lend freely at a penalty rate and against good collateral. Now, freely, yes, it was lent to the market uh, at a penalty rate, I, it's been argued that the, penal, the bank put penalty on its lending because it wanted to force banks to lend to other banks, to go into the interbank market, which, as we saw in 2007-2008, uh, fro froze, and then that's why the Fed had to come in. But they tried with this penalty rate to say, yeah, you come to my window, but you'll have to have a penalty rate because I want you to go to other banks. So other banks lend. Uh, to each other. <clears throat> and good collateral, what I hear is that the collateral in Victorian times was usually pretty good. So you didn't have to make something especially important. Okay. <clears throat> what Badger didn't say of the Bank of England, because some things hadn't happened yet, um, curiously, this great man of the central bank was in favor of free banking. He thought free banking was the natural way to do it. But there had been such a custom in England with the Bank of England that it was impossible to change that. I would go back to comp banking competition, but uh, the habit is such that no government could do what, uh, <clears throat> what some people ask. <clears throat> and he, he should have said that there was central banking because 
by centralizing your gold reserve you, you saved. There were gains uh, uh, by centralizing the reserve. And, uh, <clears throat> and that, so the, the curious thing is that he was for free banking, uh, of which we have something to say uh, lately. We said about Scotland and we have to say something later. Now, <clears throat> this is my story. Well, I had a story in, in the, the past lecture, the one how paper money progressed and people started accepting it uh, as long as you could go and get some gold to cover it. But then even if you couldn't get some gold to cover it, now we all accept, uh, we all accept uh, the, uh, these bits of paper. By the way, they are beautiful now that they're in plastic. I look at them with the transparencies. It's really extraordinary. How, how I find them very beautiful. This must be because I'm, uh, I'm a money theorist. Don't know how to make money, but I'm a monetary theorist. And you have on the notes, most of you will know that, on the notes you have, <clears throat> I promise to pay the, the bearer, promise to pay the bearer, <clears throat> on demand, uh, the amount of 10 pounds. So if you go there, they give you 10 pounds in five hours, in five hours, in one hours, in whatever. But this is an old phrase from the time when you went to the bank because you didn't trust uh, the paper they were giving you, and you went to the bank and were able to get out some, uh, some gold. So when you look at that, and this one has the phrase again, again, again a beautiful, I don't know if you admire these things, they must be very difficult to make. <clears throat> Anyhow, I, I read the phrase as a historian time and time again. Okay, so <clears throat> what, what we had is a story uh, as to how paper money was accepted slowly, as it is up to now. Paper money, not only paper money, I mean notes in books and also notes on ledgers and notes on computers and so on. <clears throat> the second story I was telling is the natural growth of central banking, which is what the lovers of central banks always insist on. <clears throat> it's something that's happened all over the world. Everybody has a central bank. Every country has a central bank <clears throat> for their sins or not. And uh, what, what you have is a natural development. And they would say it's a natural progress. I don't think it's necessarily a natural analoid progress. And <clears throat> it's true that central banks work better. And I remember what Bernanke said to Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz in the room saying, we learned from your book about the Great Depression what the Fed didn't do and now we've learned the lesson. And in fact, in fact the lesson has been applied, was applied in seven and eight. <clears throat> but as I say, for me, uh, central banks are part of, state central banks are part of the growth of Leviathan. We don't realize, but everything is becoming, depending on the state. Uh, <clears throat> we speak of neoliberalism and all that, but trade is not freed and social services are given by the state and education mostly, bad education is given by the state and so on. You go through the whole list of what we consume and it's a leviathan growing. And I think the fact that you have a well-functioning well -functioning central bank, you can have tunnel vision. See only that, but not see what happens all around. <clears throat> now, um, now I'm going to go a bit uh, into the present, but this is a history of monetary theory, and I, <clears throat> I don't want to discuss monetary policy or monetary practices today um, because it's not a part of, of my lectures. Uh, I'm looking at all this from the point of view of, of the classical, um, of classical theory. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> there's one thing I notice in people that defend central banks is that they haven't read enough on public choice. And they say, yes, we have to have a governor and we need these councillors and, and so on. They must be independent of the treasury and the state and so on. But you could have the wrong kind of, of governor. I remember Dr. Havenstein, 
he was the uh, he was the governor of the Reichsbank just at the time of the great inflation post World War One inflation in Germany and he was proud for really proud for one thing which is when you have an inflation <coughs> there comes a point when prices go on rising even if the quantity of money doesn't because people expect inflation to go on and uh, so you have inflation going further than money and then you have you don't have enough money in the country <clears throat> and he was very proud of having shipped banknotes by plane in 18 in 1921 22 and so on it was modernity doing the, the monetary policy anyhow you can have people who lose their minds at the head of of central banks I wouldn't like to point at many of them, but you do have that uh, in the world today. Um, and, and therefore, if, when you speak about the progress in central banking, uh, <clears throat> don't forget that you could have the, the wrong kind of people in charge mm, because they have interests, because they've been badly elected, and so on. Public choice theory will tell you what. <clears throat> so, uh, when I speak, as I will now, of the question of this discretion versus rules, we mustn't forget these caveats. If you say central bankers should, be, should have the discretion or the monetary policy they think is best, well, are they saints? Uh, or can they be corrupted? And so on. And the same with the rules. Will they follow the rules uh, when it goes against their interest? Well, this is very small writing. <clears throat> so you have, there are all sorts of things now that we would discuss if I were giving a series of lectures on monetary policy. And, uh, on monetary policy today, not on the theory of money and especially not on the classical theory of money. So you have the question of the independence of central banks from government. Um, how b central banks should be governed and who should be elected to govern them, um, whether the monetary policy should be governed by rules or discreetly by what the government of the central bank believes. In the case of rules, you have all those that we could discuss today or discuss in, the dis in, uh, in question time. The Milton Friedman rule, which is that the amount of, of money should grow long term at the same pace as the economy in the case of the american economy maximum four percent growth a real growth and therefore maximum a real of keeping the growth of money at four percent <clears throat> uh, milton friedman's rules have been have been modified by tim professor congdon here by tim congdon in that he thinks that the amount of the, the money that we should increase would be broad money not uh, base money as milton friedman wanted and <clears throat> And, uh, but still, it's the same thing. Uh, for Milton Friedman, money should grow at a long-term pace and you should have flexible exchange rates so that your, your economy was independent of what happened in the world, if that is at all possible. In the case of Tim Congdon, uh, he has uh, uh, based what he says on empirical data and those empirical data are very convincing. And I think that, uh, as I told him, I would love him as a governor of the Bank of England. Now, uh, I'm not in the running for saying who the governor of the Bank of England will be, and men, most of us are not. So, anyhow, he would be a very good governor. <clears throat> then, uh, I, would, I could speak about the heterodoxies in, in money. Um, the people who believe that inflation is due not to money but due to uh, to uh, a ba bad functioning of of the real economy. Again, it's very interesting that Tim Congdon has a, an article in Economic Affairs of two, 2015 in praise of expansionary. Now look at the title: in praise of expansionary fiscal contraction. So you contract fiscally, and lo and behold the economy grows better. 
that's, that's something, that article is really worth reading because it goes against the grain of everything that is said today in the press and so on. So I was, I was in, so interested by that. And when I used to teach monetary uh, theory here in, <clears throat> in this university, I won't teach it anymore in the future because they don't seem to like me. Um, I, I use that for the students. I think that they, should, they should read. But th this is beyond my four lectures on the theory of monetary history. Now, I go back to my to the beginning. Sorry, oh, I go back to the beginning. Fin principio. I'm sorry. In yeah. And the beginning is a quotation by. Oh, I'm not being very good at this. This year thing is a quotation by Hayek. I'll read it because you don't get it on the screen now. We can never <coughs> hope to preserve the economic order unless we take from the government the monopoly of issuing money. So let me go back to Hayek. Oh. Hayek and the privatization of money. Now, <coughs> He is a very, Hayek was a very serious German gentleman who smiled but rarely. And he certainly didn't pull our legs. And I remember when he published this book in 19, booklet at the IEA in 1976 called The Denationalization of Money, we were all shocked. Uh, I was presently shocked because I come to England, I come to England to see whether free trade was applicable to money. <laughs> In the Bank of Spain they said no, but here we had somebody who said we could take money away from state institutions. And then he republished <coughs> uh, the argument refined. In fact, it's the idea of, <coughs> of having private companies issuing, uh, uh, being the issuers of money. It looked jolly difficult at the time but with internet, it's changing. And suddenly we have suppliers of private money, as I'll see, we'll see in a second. Now, <clears throat> I know that maybe we, we shouldn't experiment with, uh, with these things. And it's true that democracies have learned uh, better use, a better use of money, especially the large countries. It's something nobody's explained to me, but I don't know. I, I'm surprised by it. During the 19th century, large countries had fixed exchange rates with gold. And not very respectable countries like Argentina or Spain uh, said they were on the gold standard, but from time to time they stopped paying their debt. And they, they declared that they were bankrupt for a time. In, the, in present times, the large advanced countries have flexible exchange rates. And it's the small ones who have bad government usually. Those small ones are the ones that have a fixed exchange rate, especially in Europe. In Europe, we've created a currency, and the, the members of the Eurozone have to keep, uh, well, use the euro. And so they don't have any possibility of devaluing. And that makes the Italians jolly angry, and the Poles, they are furious with this system, and so are the Spanish and so on, because uh, you can't spend what you want. The government can't spend what it wants. So there's been a learning process there, and the present system that we have with f flexible exchange rates for big countries, uh, such as the dollar and others, and, and the fixed exchange rates for less respectable countries is something maybe telling us that we are learning and we may not need the privatization of money. I don't know. This is nearly coming to an end, but the end is a really interesting bit because I'm going to talk about cryptocurrencies. I'll hear from you about cryptocurrencies. Now, <clears throat> um, why do we choose a currency to use? What, why do we choose a currency, this currency, instead of that? And it is because we want to be sure that people will accept our currency as we have uh, we have accepted being paid in them. 
The second one is that we would like to be sure that the asset denominated in that currency don't go through the floor. And then that uh, the, the, large, the larger the network, the more confident we will be of receiving monetary services. Now, that, that's a very good. If you have a new currency, you want many people to use it. Because then, uh, when you have this pot of dollars or euros or so on, and you need to buy things, you hope that people will accept it. And in the case of dollars, we'll accept it around the world. So uh, the net, it, they are network goods. <clears throat> in, the, in the sense, like telephone companies, that the more people use your telephone, your kind of telephone, the, m the, the better your system is. And that's a network I mean. So you have an entry barrier. If you are a very small new currency, such as the bit Bitcoin, if I may say so, at first it goes all over the place, up and down, and then very few people accept it in payment. Some do. At the IEA, I hear you can buy booklets with Bitcoin. But <clears throat> some, some do, but very few people use Bitcoin to buy uh, a pint of milk. So <clears throat> I, uh, I, uh, I have used uh, Kevin Dowd's book on, on uh, on new currencies, on cryptocurrencies, on digital currencies, where, with a modified quantity theory, uh, quantity theory formula he has. So, real money, m divided by p. You remember it's mv equal uh, pq, right? So you, you take the p from one side and you put it under m, and that gives you real money. m divided by p, you move it one side to the other. <coughs> um, must be equal to production, y, times v, the velocity. And what Kevin Dowd has done, he has modified, he has modified this by saying uh, we have alpha, which is a, uh, a, um, uh, a, um, a, an attempt to make the two sides in different uh, units go together. Uh, what you have is uh, y, which is the production, and there you have beta. And the beta is the income elasticity of the demand for, for the production. And usually it's, the income elasticity is around 0.5. So uh, <clears throat> what you have there is that the value of money depends here on, uh, your, on your income, uh, production, but it, ha it, it goes at the, it's the, it's the square root of the production, the elasticity of demand for money. You have demand for money, for real money, and, <clears throat> and what you have is, is uh, de depending being a, a function of y, but a declining function of y. Let's have the next one. Right. So when you have a new currency, you have there the what the new currency can buy, they change, change the P from it. But the important is the theta. The important thing is the theta. The theta is the share of the market. So you have the real value of currency depends on your income, for you, and it depends on the size, on the, on, on the share of the market that you have. If you have a small share of the market, then few people will want, will demand that currency. If you want to read Kevin Dowd, he explains it very well <coughs> in, on the internet uh, in the IEA with the title I've given you. Now, <coughs> theta goes from zero to one. And if you want to, uh, to create a new currency, the larger the custom, the more chance you have of having it accepted. If you have in a country 100% 100% market, for your pound, then uh, it'll be very difficult to displace it because people will use it uh, to get the income and also to pay. Now, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you don't have the whole market, it all depends on how big your share of the market is. <clears throat> and we go to Libra. Now, Libra, from what I've read, uh, <clears throat> is something 
different from from Bitcoin because it it already has a large market if it's if it's used. Uh, it's in, it's been set up by Facebook uh, with seven billion users per month, uh, and then you have the others the other companies that have joined them more than a dozen partners with lots of custom too, and an initial capital of one billion dollars. And so what you have there is the possibility of a large share of the market. So that gives it this new currency some uh, semblance of, uh, of, being, uh, <coughs> of, of being successful. They want to peg it to a market of international currencies. If it's successful, we'll forget about the pegging, as we've done with, with gold. So if many people use it, who cares? whether it can be changed into dollars or euros and so on. This is to start with saying we are honorable and we have this new currency that <clears throat> can be exchanged for the currencies in, in the world. <clears throat> They've domiciled it in Geneva. That, from the point of view of people who like finances, is a good thing. From the point of view of newspapers, it's a bad thing because anybody who has money in Switzerland is a, is a, is a cheat. You know that. So <clears throat> they have it in Switzerland. And then people will have a, a wallet to be able to use it to buy and sell. And the wallet is in the hands of a separate company, Calibra, and that is independent from the people who set up Facebook. Now, we are in the discussion. We're going to see what you all believe will happen with these currencies. But I want to end saying that my four lectures have been based on the idea that money is an abstract institution, one that we don't understand very well. Uh, we don't understand how it was born, who's created it, and why it's being used. It's, well, we know it's useful, but we don't understand it very well. And it has problems ever since the 16th century on the value of money, inflation and deflation, interest and usury, and then uh, the trade cycle, or the financial cycle, international trade in money, as I had last uh, in, in my last speech, and monetary management and political power. All these, all these problems I haven't solved. They haven't been solved, but they are worth studying, and that's what I've tried to do with my four lectures. Thank you.